Uh, Austin uh, is a, um, he's a non-resident senior fellow at FPRI, or at least we still hold you to be one. He is at the Rand Corporation, uh, so he's one of the reverse, uh, ver as the Simpsons called it, the reverse vampires at the Rand Corporation. Uh, and uh, he is a, uh, a scholar and a thinker and a practitioner. Uh, one of the things, uh, I should note is that when we were talking about veterans, I think one interesting thing that the last 18 years of war has produced, and it's been like this in other wars as well, but Austin and Aaron both spent time downrange in, in Afghanistan um, supporting, they were, they were military veterans, but they were working hand in hand with, with military forces. And I think moving forward in the future, um, I think that's probably a, a topic of conversation uh, for the country to kind of recognize that service as well. Um, but in any event, uh, if you, you can see from the bios, uh, Austin's very impressive resume. Uh, General Scales yesterday talked about Chatham House rules. Uh, since Austin has a child on the way, I will impose what Frank Hoffman calls random house rules and note that he has a book called The Soul of Armies, uh, comparing and contrasting uh, British and American counterinsurgency techniques. I think that's price to move. So you have uh, Easter and Passover and other holidays coming up, and I'm sure, I'm sure uh, you could purchase that. Um, as I said, you can see his, um, his resume in your files, um, but I would just point out a few things. Um, first, he was an analyst for the Combined uh, Forces Special Operations Com Component Command Afghanistan, that's a, a tongue twister. Um, a couple of years ago, he wrote a piece for FPRI uh, that we published in Orbis, which was called Small is Beautiful, and it was kind of offering a more soft-centric approach uh, to Afghanistan. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I don't think it got the kind of hearing that it deserved. He We're also, now, though, so yeah, that's true. Um, and he was also, in 2013, an analyst and advisor to NATO's Special Operations Component Command Afghanistan. So without further ado, Austin. Thanks very much. So first let me thank uh, the conference organizers for uh, inviting me out here. It's a real honor to be able to, to come speak to you guys. Um, I, I know you probably hear this, maybe not enough, but uh, you maybe hear it a lot, that you guys really are responsible for shaping our, our future fellow citizens. And so uh, it, it's a really great opportunity to come uh, help you guys think through some of these issues. Um, so, well, military assistance, maybe not the most exciting topic, um, but I'll, I'll try and give you a little bit of, of flavor for what I think makes it complicated. So outline, I'll talk a, a little bit about the history of military assistance. Uh, then I'll move to talking about the process of military assistance, which is probably the most boring bit, but there's some interesting things in there. Um, and then I'll spend most of the time on that third bullet, the politics of military assistance. Um, because the, the bottom line up front from, from my experience of military assistance, uh, you know, broadly speaking, uh, particularly in Iraq and Afghanistan, is it's not the, the process, it's not the training itself, it's not the providing uh, equipment, things like that, that's a real challenge. Um, it's the politics, and there are lots of flavors of politics. So I'll spend probably the bulk of my, uh, of my time talking on that. So first, uh, let me start before I go into the history just with a very short definition of military assistance. It's the provision of defense articles, so everything from you know, boots and rifles all the way up to tanks and jet aircraft. So defense articles, defense training, and defense advice to foreign security forces for the purposes of enhancing U.S. national security and meeting U.S. national security objectives, right? So we're gonna help other people build their security forces, which is not just militaries, uh, it also can include police and things like that. But the goal is to achieve U.S. objectives through doing that. So we're not doing it merely because we think it's a good thing to do, um, but we think that uh, it meets our objectives. So the early period of the Republic, we actually do essentially none of this, right? I have the quotes from our, our two of our founding fathers up there um, indicating that this is not a business we should really be in. We shouldn't be in alliances. We shouldn't be messing about in um, other people's um, militaries. We should focus on our, our own issues. And of course, we had a lot of our own issues. We had a frontier that we had to tame. 
Uh, we had our own civil war. So we had a lot of, of issues going on through the uh, 18th and 19th century. So um, not a lot there. And in fact, we were the recipients of military assistance during the, uh, during the War of Independence, right? From ranging from uh, people like Pulaski, uh, teaching our cavalry how to fight, uh, to, to Lafayette and people like that. This starts to change at the end of the 19th century. Uh, the U.S. starts to become uh, something of an imperial power. We start to um, have greater involvement in our own near abroad, so Central America and the Caribbean. We also have expeditions that go to China, and of course we end up with colonies in places like the Philippines. Um, but military assistance, that is helping foreign security forces, really starts to be a big part of U.S. foreign policy in the early 20th century. Um, we fight a series of conflicts that are colloquially known as the Banana Wars, mostly in Central America and the Caribbean, um, to install friendly powers, to, to, to shape the uh, foreign and domestic policies of these countries. Um, and part of that, because we don't want to send, you know, this is a period when the United States does not have a large standing military establishment, we don't want to have to govern these places ourselves, so we build local security forces to provide policing and, and military security in these environments. Um, it's usually, incidentally, the U.S. Marine Corps that, that does these things um, for reasons which I'm happy to spend as much time as you want in, in Q&A on. As Michael mentioned, I wrote a book about why that was, um, so I can, I can bore you to tears on that if you want to talk about that. Um, but the point is we spent quite a lot of time um, providing the officership, NCO, uh, Corps, and things like that to um, entities such as the Haitian Gendarmerie, um, in the Nicaraguan National Guard because we thought it was in our national security interest. But these were still fairly small-scale efforts, right? We're talking um, tens to hundreds of Marines, typically um, very uh, low budget in terms of, of what we were spending on these endeavors. This really starts to change with Lend-Lease during World War I. Um, and I just have a couple of things up there want to, to give you a sense of the scale. So Lend-Lease aid through 1943, so not even all the way through the war. Um, that's equivalent to $163 billion in 2018 dollars. So that's, that's uh, you know, even by the current standards of the Defense Department, that's quite a lot of money. Uh, by the standards of the Defense Department then, it was a huge sum of money. Um, so a really big program uh, to support our allies uh, even before we enter the war, but certainly once we enter the war. Also a sense of scale, that's a liberty ship. Um, we built 2,700 of those uh, over the course of the war primarily to provide sea lift to get American uh, munitions, troops, et cetera, um, across to Europe. So these, you know, this became a, a, pretty, a pretty big endeavor. Um, it could have shut down at the end of World War II. War's over. We'll start to demobilize. Um, instead, military assistance becomes central to U.S. foreign and security policy during the Cold War. It's one of our major tools throughout the Cold War to try and meet our national security objectives. And I give sort of two, two versions of that on the slide. The first is the rearmament of Germany. Um, and here's where politics starts to, to come into it. There were two stories about what rearming Germany meant. Re remember, this is a country we had literally just fought an incredibly bloody war with. Uh, and then uh, about eight years later, we want to not only um, recreate the German military, but make it one of our major uh, allies and bulwarks against the Soviet Union. So there's, there's sort of two sides to this story going on in Europe. The top one. In German, we protect the homeland, so this is an, this is an idea that um, this will be a sort of new form of a German army that's not an aggressive military, but instead is a very protective military. Um, at the bottom, incidentally, that's in French, so you can see where they were targeting with that. Um, this idea that, in fact, the, the Bundeswehr was going to just resurrect the Nazi German army, that you couldn't actually do this. Um, the U.S. succeeds in, in Germany, and we actually have still a very um, staunch ally, very effective military. I wish they had more tanks these days. They got rid of most of their tanks. Uh, fun fact, Greece bought most of their tanks, so now Greece has more tanks than Germany, which I never thought I would live in that world, but whatever. Um, the other side, one of our long-running conflicts, in fact, our, our longest-running conflict before uh, the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, Vietnam, we had Military Assistance Command Vietnam from 1962 to 1973. This was a much less successful endeavor in a lot of ways, um, again, primarily due to, to politics that uh, I'll go into in the, in the conclusion. So Cold War military assistance, um, very central to what we do, building allies that range from Europe and NATO to Japan to South Korea to endeavors such as uh, uh, Vietnam and then sort of more in between cases like Thailand. All right, so that's a very quick run through the history of military assistance. I'm happy to talk more about any of that in, in Q&A, but I want to move on 
uh, a little bit to, to process. So there's two organizations that are principally responsible by statute for, uh, for military assistance. The State Department, um, and specifically within State Department, there's a bureau called the Bureau of Political Military Affairs. So they make a lot of the policy decisions about who should receive what kind of military aid. And then there's the Defense Department, which actually does the heavy lifting of providing that military assistance. Um, and specifically, the, the logo up there, the Defense Security Cooperation Agency, or DISCA, is who does a lot of that lift. Um, three flavors to this. Um, one is foreign military sales. That's mostly the defense articles stuff that I mentioned, so boots to tanks. International military education, um, sometimes international military education and training, or IMET. That's the providing training and advice bit. And then there's train, advise, assist, which is something that has been less perennial. We tend to do it on a country by country basis. Uh, we've already heard um, both in uh, Aaron and Mary's presentations about the role of training um, as part of the war on terror, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. This tends to be a much more hands-on experience known as train, advise, and assist. So going through each one of these in a little more detail. Foreign military sales. Essentially what happens with foreign military sales is the United States, principally State Department, uh, but with advice from the Department of Defense, decides that it's in the U.S. national interest to provide some country with some piece of military equipment. Uh, there are a few ways you can actually do that. Uh, the foreign military sales itself uh, is a sort of interesting uh, compromise in, in how we do this. So, Essentially, a letter of agreement is signed between the foreign government, so let's say Iraq, um, and the United States government that says the United States government will act at essentially no cost, no fee, um, no markup, as the purchasing agent for that foreign country to get defense articles. And the reason we do this is it allows the United States, which we buy lots of military equipment ourselves, to get sort of the best prices and already use established relationships with defense suppliers in order to get what should be a good deal for this. Uh, because again, this is all about the US national security interest. Uncle Sam's not trying to make a buck off this. It's okay if the companies pr that provide it do, but Uncle Sam is doing this as a sort of honest broker. Um, this letter of agreement, again, it can cover everything. I've got a picture of the delivery of a Bell helicopter, but we've provided billions in foreign mil military sales to Iraq, tanks, rifles, all sorts of equipment. There are a couple of other ways you can do foreign military sales. One is foreign military financing, which is sort of uh, a middle way between just letting the country buy things itself and actually the US government acting as an agent. So we essentially provide financing guarantees. Um, same as you might for uh, you know, somebody buying a car, you could provide financing guarantees for that. Um, Uncle Sam provides financing help for people to contract directly with, with US companies. The last bit, direct commercial sales on there, um, is in some ways the simplest, and it's just a country gets approval from the United States to go direct to the manufacturer and buy Article X. Um, so direct, military, uh, direct uh, commercial sales um, are typically those countries that have the most advanced sort of procurement system, longstanding relationships, et cetera. So they're like, thanks, Uncle Sam. We actually know how to handle this. Um, we can go directly to Northrop Grumman, General Dynamics, uh, Colt, whoever it is that's going to be providing this um, and buy it directly from them. So those are the sort of three flavors of how we do this. Um, there's an entire complex web of regulations under the U.S. Foreign Assistance Act and the Arms Export Control Act um, that we can talk more about in Q&A if you want. Um, the most notable of which is the set of regulations known as ITAR, the International Trafficking in Arms Regulations. Um, ITAR governs the provision by the United States of military equipment, training, and advice to foreigners. Um, it is quite comprehensive. Um, and I'll, I'll give you a flavor for why it's comprehensive, um, and then I'll tell you why I find it personally annoying. So the, the reason it's comprehensive is because, you know, this is talking about foreign military sales in terms of providing people with bombs and rockets and things like that. But of course, Teaching people how to use this, which I'll talk about on the next slide, is also really important. Um, and therefore, we want to govern that. And so, um, just to give you an example of why this is important, in the mid-1990s, during the uh, war in the former Yugoslavia, uh, there was a lot of debate about what the United States foreign policy should be, how we should bring this war to an end through negotiations, but also through, if necessary, through military force. 
what we end up doing after the signing of, a, of an initial agreement is we allow U.S. contractors um, from a company called MPRI, not FPRI, MPRI, uh, though there could be overlap, Alan, I don't know, maybe, the, maybe your board has some MPRI folks on it. Um, these were former U.S. military officers, uh, by and large, some NCOs, uh, that had a, had a company that was set up to train people. We gave them uh, uh, approval under ITAR to provide training to the Army of Croatia, one of the combatants um, that emerged out of the former Yugoslavia. Um, apocryphally, they, were sub they essentially were there to provide training to help the, the military become better peacekeepers, but apocryphally, um, they helped them become better soldiers in general, and this led to a very successful Croatian army offensive in 1995 that was pretty decisive in the war. So the point is, ITAR is, exists to govern things like that. We don't want U.S. citizens to go train other militaries without the, the cognizance and approval of the U.S. government. Um, the reason I find it annoying is, as with all regulations and bureaucracies, you know, they've never met something they don't want to control. So my own personal experience over the past few weeks is I've been trying to hold uh, a sort of war game called a tabletop exercise. Um, and it's unclassified. Uh, and we want to be able to bring some allies in. Right? So to have the military attaches in Washington come participate in this to get their perspective. Um, in order to have them participate in this unclassified war game that will take all of a day, I have to get ITAR approval. And in fact, I have to get an ITAR exemption signed by multiple very important people. So that gives you a sense of the comprehensiveness of ITAR. It's not just tanks. It's not just bombs. It's not even um, actual military training. It extends to things like even very small unclassified war games. Um, and again, understandably, because we want to make sure that you know, we're not training foreign militaries uh, without the U.S. government knowing about it, but it does, it does cause me some level of personal heartburn at times. So foreign military sales, that's stuff. There's then international military education and training. Again, it's a joint State Department um, and Defense Depar Department set of programs. Uh, it covers everything from uh, student foreign exchange. Um, Mary mentioned a, a U.S. officer that had trained at the infantry school. We have uh, we have uh, foreign uh, military come from basically all over the world to go to a great many of our schools, um, ranging from the U.S. Army Helicopter School in Fort Rucker, Alabama, to very senior officers that go to the U.S. National Defense University in Washington. And many of them end up going on to lead their country's militaries, becoming chief of defense staff or minister of defense or what have you. So that, that's sort of the high end. The low end is just making sure that foreign militaries have some set of people that speak English so that they have a better ability to interface um, as necessary with the United States military. Um, so uh, Mary mentioned Indonesia. Uh, U.S. Uh, has had longstanding uh, inter international military education programs with them. Um, the pictures from a, a training exercise in 2013, um, Indonesian and U.S. Marines training together. One highlight on this is it's partly about technical training, right? Whether that's basic rifle marksmanship, teaching people how to shoot, teaching people how to move tactically, communicate, et cetera. But there's also an idea of we're going to transmit US values, right? To some degree of respect for human rights, um, some degree of respect for democracy, et cetera. I'm happy to talk more about this in Q&A. I think the evidence for this is mixed. Um, so people point to the Egyptian army during the Arab Spring in 2011, and it's sort of reluctance to really go all in on suppressing uh, protesters in Tahrir Square. And in fact, they proved willing to throw their civilian leadership under the bus, more or less. And people take that as, well, we've had this longstanding um, international military education training effort with the Egyptians that goes back, as, as Mary suggested, goes back decades. Um, this must have really shaped how the Egyptians view this. Well, that's one version of the story. The other version is the Egyptian military cares about the Egyptian military, and they're happy to throw civilians under the bus as long as their prerogatives are respected. So I'm happy to talk more about that in Q&A, um, but I think all I'm trying to convey is it's quite hard to convey, to convey values to people um, in just a few months or even a year if they come to the National Defense University that really radically change who they are. And you guys have experience with having students on a limited basis, um, you can think about, you know, the difficulty in really in inducing um, substantial change, right? You can edu you educate people in a limited period of time. It's hard to really change people. But sometimes you have success. 
So train advise assist. This is a little different flavor. It had, tends to have less of the State Department involvement, though there's usually some at the very high policy level. It tends to be a much more hands-on Department of Defense um, sort of endeavor. Um, it's m much more intense than the international military education and training tends to be. What, what these situations end up with, um, and Michael was actually on one of these teams, you have a small team that actually embeds with a foreign military or police unit. Um, and small is maybe a dozen, um, maybe a few more, maybe a few less. Um, but the idea is we're not just going to teach you in a classroom setting. We're going to teach you in the field, not always, but frequently in the field, and we're also going to provide the advise and assist piece. So training is, is basically teaching. Advice is they're going to do, and you will sort of look over their shoulder or stand behind them, right? So those of you that went through the museum yesterday, you know, there are, there are all the operational maps that they have up. Um, essentially, you would be there as your partner unit, say an Afghan police unit, was drawing up those maps. You would be there to say, well, did you think about this? What about that? Um, and then the assist piece is to actually provide something um, that enables those operations that you're helping them plan. So providing an enabler or providing assist could be logistics, right? Many of these units are very good at fighting, but you have to have bullets and things like that to fight, so making sure that those supplies get there. It can be intelligence, right? The United States spends um, way more on intelligence annually than most countries spend on their entire defense budget, so you can provide them some of the intelligence um, that spending provides from satellites to communications intercepts, et cetera. Um, it can be uh, transportation, so people have to get to the fight, so you could provide helicopter support to lift people to the fight, things like that. So the big difference is this tends to be a much more operational level um, and therefore a more risky endeavor. Training people um, at Fort Benning is, is one thing. People do occasionally have casualties in that, but it's pretty rare whereas casualties and train advise assist missions, um, rare relative to combat, but much less rare than if you're doing training domestically. So this is a lot of what the United States, those of you that, that follow what's going on in Syria, this is a lot of what the United States do, has done in terms of providing support to different groups in Syria. We've had a number of casualties there. Um, we're currently in a standoff uh, of sorts with our own ally, the Turks, about certain parts of uh, Syria that the United States has provided this sort of uh, train, advise, and assist to. Um, I note two programs in there that are, are oddballs, and I'm happy to talk more about them in Q&A, but after September 11th, Congress decided that the current, then current, um, way of doing military assistance through foreign military sales and international military education and training was insufficiently quick and flexible to meet the demands of the global war on terror. So through provisions in a National Defense Authorization Act, which is how Congress sort of pays for the military, um, they created two programs um, known, you know, affectionately by the bit of the U.S. Code, that particular NDA there. In, so Section 1206, Section 1208. Um, these give the Department of Defense more flexible authorities to provide this sort of train, advise, and assist support um, in the global war on terrorism. Uh, and we can talk more about that in Q&A, but the, the reason I mention it is um, it goes against, to some degree, the, the model that the U.S. developed in the Cold War, which was this very close State Department plans um, and Department of Defense executes foreign assistance. There, there are those who feel this gives DOD too much say in U.S. foreign policy because they have these tools and sources of money they can use with, not without State knowing about it, but with much less State involvement um, in the process, particularly 1208, um, which essentially says DOD can give 50 to 200 million dollars a year to whoever it wants if they'll help fight terrorists. And State Department's like, yeah, is that really how we want to do things? So, that's a long march through a lot of topics that I'm happy to cover more in Q&A, but I want to spend the rest of my time, uh, which by my count is about half my time, on this bit, which is the political piece of military assistance. Um, because I said at the beginning, um, training people Providing people with equipment is a relatively straightforward process. There can be challenges in it, but the United States military trains young Americans every day how to do it. It buys stuff every day. Getting it to foreigners absent political issues is relatively straightforward. However, there are three slices of politics that then intersect with this provision of military assistance. And given that we're talking about this uh, provision of assistance as part of 
uh, achieving U.S. national security objectives, this shouldn't be particularly surprising. But it's worth spending some time on. So that's U.S. domestic politics plays a role in this. International politics plays a role in military assistance. And foreign domestic politics plays a role in this. I'll probably spend the most time um, on that third category. But the pictures, one is um, it's no longer called the School of the Americas, but for a very long time uh, at Fort Benning, the United States Army ran a training school for officers from Latin America. Um, that m many in the United States came to view as a school for assassins or a school for dictators. These are people that were trained by the U.S. Army and then would go home and in the view of protesters, such as the priests protesting there, um, they then just became part of this massive repressive apparatus. So this caused a real um, controversy about the provision of military mm -hmm. assistance. Other people can complain about this. So the other picture is a protest by um, Shiite adherents of the, of the cleric um, Muqtada Sadr, who are protesting a 2011 status of forces agreement that would have let US military personnel stay in pretty significant numbers to provide that training, advice, and assistance um, to the Iraqi government. And they were saying, nope, we just want the Americans out. Um, you know, they, they said this was just an extension of occupation. So, so politics plays a big role in military assistance. So domestic politics, it does a bunch of different things in terms of military assistance. One, it can determine the form of assistance. So in 2013, um, as the Russian intervention in Crimea and Ukraine became more apparent, Congress decided that the United States should no longer purchase on behalf of others uh, and pay for Russian military equipment. Well, we make lots of stuff. Why wouldn't we just give them American stuff? Why are we buying Russian equipment in the first place? Well, many of our allies, and particularly in Afghanistan, this is what they had experience with, was Soviet model equipment going back to the, to the 1970s. So they already knew how to operate it. Um, Russian slash Soviet equipment is basically built for rugged conditions. Um, they may not be the best performing equipment, but they're the kind of equipment that will perform when you want it to perform. Um, some of the Russian helicopters, which is what we were, we were really interested in providing to the Afghans, were able to operate in the mountainous, very high altitude areas of Afghanistan that a lot of other helicopters have trouble operating in. So from a military perspective, um, there was a strong case that, yeah, Russia is bad, but we should still buy these helicopters and give them to the Afghans. And Congress said, absolutely not. What part of no do you not understand? So there was actually discord between Congress and certainly the command in Afghanistan about this provision. Um, so eventually, um, we were not allowed to, to proceed with that um, because it had become a domestic political issue for the United States. Domestic politics also helps determine the level of assistance, so not just the what form it takes, but the level of assistance. So in the 1970s, as the Vietnam War wound down, um, and the Nixon administration and later Ford administration got into a lot of political trouble, uh, Congress wanted to appropriate less and less to continue the provision of assistance to the South Vietnamese government. Um, they never cut it off entirely, but they provided less and less uh, until finally uh, the government of, of South Vietnam comes to an end in 1975. So the, the president, despite wanting to provide a certain level of assistance, was constrained um, as that war became unpopular and as the president became politically unpopular. Flip side is Israel in the 1980s. Um, you know, the United States has had a pretty strong relationship with Israel going back several decades. Um, but in the 1980s, there was real um, and growing congressional support to provide a lot of support to the Israelis before we had provided um, fairly modest amounts. So um, congressional support can not only push down the level of, of assistance, it can also push it up. Um, the picture uh, I have there, many of you may have heard of the movie or book, Charlie Wilson's War. Uh, Charlie Wilson was a Texas uh, representative, a Democrat actually. Um, and he was one of the driving forces not behind the provision of aid to the Afghan fighters resisting the Soviets um, in the 1980s, but he was a big driver of increasing that aid. And that's him actually in Afghanistan, um, which he visited, I think, more than almost anybody in the 1980s. Um, so he actually pushed more money than CIA and the military actually wanted. They said, we can't spend this money effectively. It won't be covert. He said, I don't care. These people are doing the right thing and he almost single-handedly increased the scale of that program by an order of magnitude. So his, you know, this one representative was able to, to drive up the levels of support um, for domestic political reasons. And then finally, domestic politics also limits who can receive military assistance. Um, a couple that I'll note, one that's still in effect, the so-called Leahy Amendments, 
These essentially say that the United States, the president, has to certify human rights compliance by whatever organization that we're providing military assistance to. So we have to say that the Afghan uh, military, the Afghan police, the Iraqi military, Pakistani military at different points, um, even you know, many of our, our allies in the Western Hemisphere, so Colombia, um, we have to certify their respect human rights in order to be able to provide military assistance to them. So this is a, this, the Leahy Amendment named for Senator Patrick Leahy, um, who decided that this was, this was a really important um, part of achieving U.S. national security objectives, was not just to make countries uh, military stronger, but to make sure that they had a respect for human rights and democracy. The Boland Amendment was a little more controversial. This was a prohibition through a series of changes to the law on the uh, U.S. military and any part of the U.S. government providing assistance um, to the rebels in Nicaragua known as the Contras. Um, and this ultimately leads to an even bigger political scandal, the so-called Iran-Contra scandal, as parts of the executive branch decided to circumvent Congress's decision. They came up with an elaborate scheme to use money from selling uh, the Israelis missiles who sold them to the Iranians, and then that got by. Anyway, it was a whole big thing, uh, which I'm happy to talk more about in Q&A, but it all came about because of a congressional domestic political decision to prevent the president from providing this aid to the Contras, and it ends up in people going to jail. So if domestic politics is important, international politics is at least as important. Um, it can generate tensions um, between countries, so I have a picture at the top that's from um, Tbilisi, Georgia. It's actually on the main road to the airport. Uh, it's President George W. Bush Street. Why did they name their main road to the airport George W. Bush Street? It's because the United States started after uh, September 11th providing military assistance to the Georgian government, which was totally fine. Georgia was happy to have it. Um, unfortunately, the Russians were not so happy about it. And eventually, in 2008, um, for a, a whole host of sort of complex reasons, um, the Georgian government ends up going to war with Russia, in part because it had confidence in its military after several years of military assistance from the United States. Um, so this caused a real um, issue, not just between Georgia and Russia, but also between the United States and Russia. Um, one that I didn't put on there, but is, is more proximate. Uh, in 2016, uh, the United States government began considering providing um, so-called lethal aid to the Ukrainian government to fight against separatists in eastern Ukraine. And one of the things they wanted to provide were long-range anti-tank missiles called javelins. Um, so this system would have given the Ukrainians a better ability to fight Russian tanks. I was in Moscow around the time this sort of discussions of this decision became public, and one of my Russian interlocutors basically said, look, you guys have people there that are training the Ukrainians on how to do various things. If you provide this, these weapons, you know, bad things can happen to people, and not just in eastern Ukraine, but western Ukraine. And it was essentially a fairly direct, if veiled, threat that if you provide this, U.S. servicemen's lives will be at risk, servicemen and women, um, in Ukraine for providing this. Um, I highlight this because the first delivery of javelins to the Ukrainians um, took place just a couple of weeks ago. So it will be interesting to see going forward how that affects the U.S. relationship and whether this threat proves to be empty or not. I suspect it will, but we'll see. It also complicates the provision of military assistance, international politics. Um, I mentioned uh, the U.S. relationship with Israel in the 1980s was growing a lot stronger. There was a lot of domestic support that was growing for Israel. Um, the Reagan administration at the same time decided it wanted to build up its relationship with Saudi Arabia. Um, we, we, the United States, were looking for someone to replace Iran as our major sort of ally and bulwark against communism in the region. Um, so we wanted to build this relationship with Saudi Arabia, which was not new, but we wanted to make it a lot stronger. So we decided to sell um, five of the planes down at the bottom, the AWACS, the Airborne Warning and Control System. This is a very expensive very complex piece of equipment that is very important to fighting sort of air-to-air -air combat, so fighter versus fighter kind of combat. Um, the Israelis were, to put it mildly, livid. They were like, absolutely not. The Saudis still basically say that the, that the state of Israel has no right to exist and that we, should, we, the Jews, should be pushed into the sea. How can you even consider providing this very important piece of military equipment um, to our enemies? Um, and there was a lot of resistance in Congress to this deal because Congress has said very supportive of Israel. 
Um, the Reagan administration eventually managed to push this through, but it took about five years for the deal to be completed. Um, and it was, as I say, it was quite controversial. Um, the interesting thing is times change. Um, so just a couple of years ago, the Saudis wanted to upgrade these planes, um, and the United States agreed to another package of military assistance that would help them upgrade these planes. Um, the Israeli response, and I'll, I'll quote, was, we're not thrilled about it, right? So they'd come a long way from absolutely not, this is the worst thing in the world, to now, meh, it's not that, we're not you know, happy about it, but it's fine. A lot of this, again, has to do with international politics. So in the 1980s, the Saudis were seen as an, as an enemy of the Israelis. Now they share a much bigger and more important common enemy in Iran. So the Israelis, again, not thrilled about it, but fine. Those AWACS are gonna be aimed at the Iranians, not us. So international politics, big part of the decision making that goes on um, in, uh, in military assistance. Last slide, which I will probably spend the remaining 10 minutes or so of my time on, um, a little bit in story mode, but we'll, we'll call it, we'll call it um, illustrative anecdotes rather than story mode. Um, the single biggest obstacle in my experience um, to effective military assistance tends to be other people's domestic politics, so the domestic politics of the country or countries you're trying to provide um, aid to. And I put the picture of two books up there, um, Sam Huntington, Harvard professor, Sam is one of those people that as a writer kind of bums you out because most people don't get to write a sort of path-defining or path-breaking book. They don't get to write one. Sam has written multiple path-breaking books. Um, so I put two of them up there that I think get at, these, at, at the problems. The first is um, the, called The Soldier and the State. It's about the relationship between civilians and their militaries um, in, in various countries in various ways. The other is political order and changing societies, which is about what happens as societies start to change, start to modernize, start to democratize, et cetera. Um, and I think these two books uh, very well capture 90% you know, of, of what goes on in these countries that makes military assistance difficult and that I'll talk to um, a little more anecdotally. So one of the highlights, though, is the tension between building effective military organizations and ensuring domestic political control. We in the United States um, almost, but not quite, take for granted that the military is subordinate um, to the civilian government, and that there's essentially no chance, despite you know, really entertaining movies like The Enemy Within or Seven Days in May, that there's really no chance that there'll be a military coup in the United States, that the military will one day try to take over society, et cetera, et cetera. Um, some attitudes about that may be changing now, but in general, that's been the, that's been the, US, uh, the US view. Um, not true in other countries. Um, I'll highlight a couple before I then go through some that I've had um, personal experience with. So one was in Vietnam, where we were, had a military assistance command for, for more than a decade. Um, there was not just one coup, there were actually a series of coups starting in 1963. The military got rid of the civilian leader, Ziem, um, he was replaced by uh, a junta of generals, who were then replaced by another junta of generals, who were then replaced by another general, who were then finally, that guy got elected president. Um, this was extremely disruptive to the provision of military assistance because the primary driver for any choices the, the civilian government made about the military was not, will these guys get better at fighting, right? Who's the best leader? Uh, who has the best training, et cetera, it was primarily who's going to back me if somebody tries to conduct a coup. And this is a very common problem in, in developing countries is you have to worry at least as much about the loyalty of the military to the civilian leadership as you do about whether the military is any good at fighting. Um, because they might not be able to fight other countries, they might not be able to fight insurgents in the way Aaron talked about, but they can probably march on the Capitol and, and shoot the president. So you have to worry quite a lot about that. Coming forward, and this is something I have some personal experience with um, in Iraq, uh, the United States spent, uh, as it did with Vietnam, billions of dollars um, over a decade trying to build Iraqi security forces. It's military, police, intelligence services, et cetera. After 2011, um, many of the best uh, officers that we had trained um, in the Iraqi police particularly began to be purged. They were accused of corruption and sent to jail. Some of them were just shunted off to other units. 
the reason was, as the situation, security situation in Iraq got better, Aaron showed you the graphics on, on that, um, the insurgency was actually a lot weaker, the police decided to start going after um, other, other sort of bad actors inside Iraq. Aaron mentions um, Shiite militias particularly. Um, when the police went to crack down on, on these organizations um, in this safer time, the response from the Iraqi government was, mm, you know, these militias also have political parties. Um, they are, they're part of the government. Like, you kind of got to treat them with kid gloves. The officers we trained, as we sort of trained them to, said, well, but they're breaking the law, right? They're an illegal armed group. Um, you know, they're coercing people. They're threatening people. Like, we got to dial this in. And the response was, no, actually, and in fact, we'll charge you with corruption. We'll charge you with cooperating with terrorists, et cetera, et cetera. So many of the leaders that we had put in place um, were removed as a result of that. So I'll give you a few more examples um, of this from my personal experience, and again, we can talk more in Q&A. So sometimes domestic politics is really challenging, um, not because they won't let you help, but they don't want to help one another. So one of my big tasks in Afghanistan in 2013, working with US Special Operations, actually NATO Special Operations, was to try to convince the Afghan National Intelligence Service, so their equivalent of CIA, known as the National Directorate of Security, or NDS, so they were the intelligence collectors for the, for the country and, and abroad, to actually provide intelligence to the police. Because the NDS, they had some guys that could go out and arrest people, but their main job was intelligence collection. The police actually had lots of guys with guns. I mean, they were essentially SWAT teams. Um, so you'd think it would be a natural cooperative relationship. Well. Mary mentioned the looming tower and the problems US CIA and FBI had. That's got nothing on the NDS police relationship um, where it was deeply hostile. The NDS thought that the, the police were amateurs who would just um, ruin their intelligence collection uh, and the uh, police basically thought the NDS didn't know what they were doing um, in a variety of ways and were probably deeply corrupt, which was not entirely untrue. Um, so I spent a large chunk of 2013, along with a British Special Operations Lieutenant Colonel, trying to convince parts of the, of the Afghan government to share with each other and play nice. Um, I'll go ahead and confess, I don't think we were particularly successful, right? But those are the kind of challenges you run into in, in the domestic politics part of this. Um, Aaron mentioned one uh, program known as the Sons of Iraq in, in Iraq. Um, there you run into a similar but different kind of internal politics. Sons of Iraq were irregulars that the United States uh, had uh, decided to help train and arm outside of the Iraqi army, outside of the Iraqi police. Many of them had been um, insurgents fighting against the United States and the Iraqi government. They had changed sides. We were happy to take them because they knew quite a lot about the insurgency, so they were going to be a very effective tool. In just a few years, we had 100,000 of them. Uh, the Iraqi government was not super excited about this. They basically said, in as many words, why are you arming terrorists? We're just going to have to kill them later. Um, that was not the U.S. attitude. So this was an extremely contentious program um, inside Iraq. And of course, what happens after 2011 when the United States leaves? You can probably guess these guys are left alone with an Iraqi government that thinks they're terrorists. Many of them were then arrested. Um, those that weren't arrested were kicked out of, of service, um, and they end up joining the insurgency again. So many of these guys that had been sons of Iraq end up going back to fight with what is now the Islamic State. And again, this is all about Iraqi domestic politics that has very little to do um, with the United States. There's also a lot of politics and corruption, which um, Erin mentioned in her, her Q&A, that comes up in this. So the United States provides a lot of resources to Iraq and Afghanistan not only for training, but also to buy stuff. Well, I'll give you probably the most egregious example of where this goes wrong um, in, uh, in Iraq. And this was not a US FMS program, but it was using resources the US provided. Um, in 2008, the Iraqis started telling us about this great new thing that a contractor had showed them. Um, explosives were a big problem in Iraq, car bombs, things like that. So it, you, they had checkpoints all over the place where people had to, you know, just like going to the airport or wherever you had to open up um, everything, let the police look through them. So this contractor was going to sell them um, a rod that would point to explosives. So it would make these checkpoints go much more smoothly. Guy could just have a rod pointed at 
at the trunk of the car and it would point to the explosives. Many of you are grinning because you're like, so it's an explosive dowsing rod? Yes, it's an explosive dowsing rod. It had about as much science behind it as a regular dowsing rod. But the major general, the Iraqi police major general in charge of procurement, decided he wanted to buy a lot of these. And they weren't cheap. The retail price was like about 12,000 bucks. But then he ended up paying 37,000 bucks per unit. Iraq, not a rich country. Uh, so what was the explanation for that? You will be unsurprised to know that he had a great many political connections. Major General Jihad was his name. He had a great many political connections. Um, and that money, a lot of it was skimmed off, and it went to provide political patronage and um, to uh, his network. He was finally, even by Iraq standards, this was too egregious, and he was finally arrested in 2011. But for three years, I would sit in meetings with Iraqi police, and including this general, and be like, what? what? And his response was like, no, no, it works fine. You just have to shuffle your feet to build up static electricity, and then it works fine. And I was like, I know I quit taking drugs a long time ago, so it can't be that. What is going on here? But the, the answer is, it's domestic politics. Um, so I'll conclude with, um, and I, you know, I have more if we want to go do more in Q&A, but I'll conclude with, why can't the United States stop this, right? We're providing billions of dollars to some of these countries. Um, why can't we just say, look, as Aaron sort of alluded to, why can't we just tell them to knock it off or else we're going to stop providing aid, right? Seems pretty simple. Well, the answer, um, you know, apocryphally is the same as the answer about, you know, when you owe money to the bank that's attributed to, to John Paul Getty, right? If you owe the bank $100, you have a problem. If you owe the bank $100 million, the bank has a problem, right? So the problem we have is these countries, many of them, we see for our own national security reasons, we can't let them fail, right? We can't cut them off because if the government of Afghanistan collapses, our ability to conduct counterterrorism operations will be greatly curtailed. We've already seen in Iraq um, what happens when the government sort of halfway collapses, right? And you have a huge outflux of refugees because it has knock-on effects in Syria and Jordan and et cetera, et cetera. So the reason we have so little leverage is we're at least as committed to these countries surviving as the leadership of these countries are, and it makes it very hard to cut them loose. Um, Aaron mentioned uh, El Salvador. That's the sort of exception that proves the rule um, because as the Cold War came to an end, we could literally go to the Salvadoran government and say, the commies are going away, bro. Like, you, if you want any help from us, you have to start listening to us. And they said, essentially, all right, I guess we'll come to the peace table and negotiate because we could now credibly say we were going to cut you loose. But absent the ability to credibly say we're going to walk away if you don't change your behavior, it becomes really difficult to get leverage. Um, and in fact, the more aid, the more military assistance you're providing, the more difficult it is to cut loose in those circumstances because you're so committed. Well, thanks very much. I'll stop there, and I look forward to your questions. Thanks very much, Austin. Um, I think Mike was right. Uh, this was a topic that only Austin Long could make uh, really uh, gripping, and uh, we thank you for Hopefully. that. Hopefully. My pleasure. So we'll take questions. Uh, Joseph. Joseph Ostrowski, Travis Early College, San Antonio, Texas. Being in San Antonio, we uh, have an opportunity to see military assistance at a different level, not with technical hardware, but with military uh, training for uh, uh, the hospitals, yep. over at Bamsey and over at Wilford Hall. And in one instance, I was at a hotel at breakfast and I saw 13 different uniforms at, at the same place they were all going to Bamsey to learn how to do some type of technical training with the uh, military doctors. Could you elaborate more on, on that type of aspect of military assistance? Sure, we provide a, a ton of that kind of very specific technical training that's not just about um, sort of military only tasks. So we've talked, you know, I mentioned Fort Rucker where we train people to fly helicopters, but of course there's a lot more to military than just, you know, shooting and flying that we train people in how to run radios and communication networks. We train people on computer technology. We train people, obviously, on medical. That's a big part of the, the sort of combat support function. Um, so the United States provides training on a, a vast array of, of uh, technical activities that aren't sort of combat specific. And medical is a huge one, absolutely. 
Good afternoon, Brandy Love, Memphis, Tennessee, Kirby High School. Um, in your opinion, because I know you can't predict the future, <laughs> but in your opinion, considering our current administration, where do you see military assistance going forward, considering that we have a current administration that, for lack of a better term, is not so much diplomatic? That's a really great question. Um, so at least my experience is there's, there's a, something of a bifurcation in what's going on in the US government right now. Again, my perspective, I'm not speaking for my employer or anybody else, um, where a lot of the machinery is still turning over. So I mentioned the Defense Security Cooperation um, Agency. That's their job. There's thousands of people that that's what they do. And so they're sort of, until somebody says, no, stop what you're doing, they'll keep running these programs. Um, the current administration has not really, you know, despite its rhetoric, has not really reached down into the bureaucracy to sort of turn a lot of that off yet. So that could be coming. Um, you know, I think at least the current Secretary of Defense, General Mattis, he's a strong proponent of these activities. I mean, it's a lot of his professional career was actually um, in the Middle East, you know, working on uh, things that involved a lot of military assistance. He's certainly a strong proponent of our other allies. So I think he'll be a, a continued strong voice for this. Um, but it, there's a little bit of tension, right, with the, with the idea of we should look more inward, we should spend, you know, spend more money making America great again. You have to sort of sell people that this isn't charity that we provide to other countries, that it's an important way to achieve US national security objectives. And I'll give the president credit. When he came in, he essentially said, We've been in Afghanistan 15 years providing military assistance, among other things. Is this really the right way to go? And I think that it's, you know, that's not irresponsible to say we've, we've tried it this way for 15 years, maybe we should review it. At least so far, we're continuing more or less with what we've been doing in Afghanistan with some tweaks on, on the margins. Um, but that could change. I could very well see, I mean, not just the president, but the American people more broadly saying, okay, we're at a point, and this is, this is not a joke, where friends of mine that served in the early part of the Afghan war, even the middle part of the Afghan war, their kids are about to be of, of age to enlist in the military. Many of you probably have, have kids in that range. So, you know, it is entirely possible at some point in a few years that, you know, young men and women will be patrolling the same parts of Afghanistan that their parents patrolled, you know, 18 years earlier not to get on my soapbox, but you can see why the American people would say, okay, military assistance generally might be fine, but I'm not really sure it's achieving those national security objectives you said. So I don't know if that answered your question, but that's sort of my thoughts on the future of military assistance. Mike Anderson, Orange County, California. A um, Couple quick comments on the question. Um, with respect to the Sons of Iraq, I, I felt that uh, when I was there in 07, in 08, that that was some of the best money being spent during that time. Ten dollars a day, keeping bombs out of the roads. Yep. Um, the shakes used to tell us, with respect to your comments on corruption, that uh, that the culturally appropriate skim was about not to exceed ten percent. That's what we were told, and um, you know, luckily we we didn't see anything as egregious as you know twenty five thousand twenty five thousand dollars. <laughs> um, the question I had uh, with respect to another experience that I had with the Saudis, uh, two programs that I, we were kind of co-located with and came into constant contact with, you submit them and OPM saying, do those programs exist still? And could you elaborate on those? So, yeah, so just on your comments, I mean, this highlights, you know, some of the challenges, right? So Sons of Iraq, very effective program uh, in, in Iraq, as you say, it really, it, it turned the tide. I mean, Aaron talked about sort of causes of, of, you know, why things changed in Iraq. I think it's very much more the awakening in the Sons of Iraq than, you know, the surge, right? The surge was necessary in some ways to enable the Sons of Iraq, but I think it much more, you know, if you can assign weights to causal factors, went to them. So I agree with you 100%. The people that didn't agree, were the people in the Ministry of Interior and the Prime Minister's office, right? That was the real problem. Um, and this is not a unheard of problem in these kind of things. So we, we tried something similar in Afghanistan, which I didn't talk to, but I'll take the opportunity for a little more story hour, um, with something called the Afghan Local Police Program, 
which was a similar idea of let's empower very local people to defend their communities and we'll enable them with special operations units. Um, again, very, very good idea. When it worked, it worked very well. The problem was, and the same with Sons of Iraq, you're telling a government that we're going to arm people that are not wearing a uniform, or at least initially wearing a uniform, um, that maybe don't like you very much, and maybe that's the reason they're willing to work with the United States, but not to join the army, the, the Iraqi or Afghan army. Governments don't tend to like that. You can imagine what the response would be if, you know, in the U.S. federal government, if something, somebody said something similar. They're like, we're going to go to Western North Carolina, where I grew up, um, and, you know, the people here in, in Asheville, we're going to start arming uh, because they'll do a better job than the, than the FBI and the, the state police will. People don't tend to like that. Even though it's very effective, it can run into these real domestic political problems. Um, so I agree with you 100%, but this is the problem we run into when we when we try these sort of end runs around the state. Um, in terms of Saudi programs, I don't know those particular programs. We still have ongoing, uh, you know, a variety of military assistance programs with the, with the Saudis. Um, you know, we've, d just in terms of foreign military sales, you know, we've had a couple of packages in the tens of billions that we're providing to them over the past few years. Um, the Saudis are not hurting for money. The real problem with the Saudis is um, again, it's domestic politics, right? You get to be a very senior um, figure in the Saudi military, principally because of you know, your ties to the royal family, not because of your competence. Um, and you can see in the war in Yemen that the Saudis are conducting, despite having an incredibly lavishly well-equipped military, they've not done very well. And it's because they don't promote, in the first instance, to, to senior levels based on competence, right? In US military, broadly speaking, very meritocratic, not so much Saudi Arabia. You can contrast that, I'll stop here, you can contrast that with their neighbors next door in the United Arab Emirates. The Emirates don't have nearly as much money as the Saudis, they don't have nearly the population, but they have decided over the past 15 years, they actually care a lot more about promoting based on competence rather than sort of political connections. Not perfect, it's not like they mirror the US military in that competence, but they have gotten a lot better. They have also been willing to put troops in harm's way in a way the Saudis were reluctant to until Yemen. Um, so you know, going back to 2010, I can remember seeing UAE helicopters and UAE special operations forces in Afghanistan working alongside the US. So the reason I highlight that is some, so there's, there's a notion that you know, these Gulf monarchies just can't fight because they're not very good at it, right? The sort of Kuwait 1990 syndrome. It's not really that. It's about political decisions about what they want to emphasize and what risks they want to take. The Saudis still very much are worried about domestic problems more than they are external adversaries. That may be changing, um, but the UAE has changed pretty significantly in terms of thinking we need to be focused on outward rather than inward. It was a long answer, but. Hi, Patrick Mahoney, uh, New Orleans, Louisiana. Uh, I had a two-part question about the School of the Americas. Yep. Uh, first part, what level of culpability do you think the United States has for some of the atrocities committed by the graduates of the School of the Americas? And second part, uh, to what extent did the protests uh, at the School of the Americas caused any type of internal review of the, pra of the type of training they were doing, uh, and did it cause any changes other than the title change to a less chantable name? So I'll say it's a little broader. I mean, School of the Americas became, as you know, as you know the sort of poster child for this um, in the 1980s, but it, it's a broader question than just School of the Americas. It's a question of if you train people and arm them, how responsible are you for their behavior? And that's true in Iraq and Afghanistan as much as it was in El Salvador, um, as much as it uh, was in Vietnam in the 1960s and 1970s. Um, I don't have a really good answer. I don't think it's a cut and dried answer. Um, because you, know, you have two sort of con contending issues. One is the, the moral issue, right, that sort of Mary alluded to and why we don't do certain things. And the other is you're trying to achieve national security objectives with these tools. Um, so in terms of level of culpability, I don't think it's proximate. In other words, I don't think we train people and said, okay, go home and torture people and you know, murder nuns. That's what you guys should be up to. On the other hand, you know, if you arm someone and they shoot someone with that weapon, you do have, I think, some level of responsibility, even if it's sort of at one remove. Um, but this is a problem that has bedeviled US and military assistance you know, 
not so much in Lend-Lease, but even there, because we were providing military assistance to the Soviet Union, right? Which we knew was not super nice to its own people, right? So you end up, um, in some ways, uh, you know, trying to do your best to inculcate values into people, but knowing, as I sort of alluded to, you're probably not gonna change them at their core. You're actually better off the real change with behavior related to the School of Americas, at least in El Salvador, which is a country I know best, was when we could threaten that all that was gonna come to an end, right? We're not gonna train you anymore, we're not gonna provide bullets, we're not gonna provide anything, because Congress is gonna cut you off, right? So you need to change your behavior. Um, and I know, you know, from personal experience talking to people that were involved, that had a real and measurable impact on the behavior of the Salvadoran military, not because they suddenly became good respecters of human rights, but they had to get it down to a level that it was not on the front page of the New York Times, that was not having those protests covered. So those protests, I think, had a measurable impact if indirectly, because it put pressure on Congress, Congress put pressure on the executive, the executive then put pressure on the Salvadorans. So to my mind, that's the best way you can get that kind of leverage to change behavior is to threaten to cut it off. But as I alluded to, in many of these countries, it's tough to threaten that because they're so important to you, right? You wanna change corruption in Afghanistan, you tell them, well, we're walking away if you don't change. But that threat has not to date been terribly credible to the governments in Kabul because they know that as soon as there's an attack in the United States that has any connection to Afghanistan after we let that government go away, that president is gonna be blamed. Why did you, you didn't learn the lesson from the 1990s? You have to stay in Afghanistan. Right? So to my mind, that's the real challenge is there's a moral responsibility, but that's balanced against you know, these national security and political objectives. In terms of the change, I think it was partly um, in terms of curriculum, but mostly <laughs> cosmetic. Okay, join me in thanking Dr. Thank you.